If you clicked on this video, you probably already know that Barcelona will have their hands full with Bayern Munich on Friday in their Champions League quarterfinal matchup. Unlike the Napoli match, this is the only preview coming out for the fixture against Bayern. But don't worry, this one is jam-packed full of good stuff. Today, we're talking about what makes the Bavarians tick. Yes, that was a cuckoo clock joke. Why Bayern Munich are so dominant, and what Barcelona can do to overcome the Champions League favorites. Hi, I'm Dan Hilton. This is a Barcelona podcast, YouTube exclusive. This will be the 11th all-time matchup between these two European giants. That's a bit surprising considering the number of decades these two clubs have featured in European competitions, but it is interesting that their top seasons rarely coincide with one another. Bayern have long been dominant in Germany, but after Johan Cruyff and Ajax were done conquering Europe in the early 70s, Bayern won three European Cups of their own in 1974, 75, and 76. At the same time Cruyff had just moved to Barcelona, and while they were able to win the Liga upon Cruyff's arrival, European success was a ways off for Barcelona. For both clubs, actually. Bayern won their fourth European Cup, now the Champions League, in 2001, coinciding with another dark period in Barca's history. The 2012-13 season was finally the season where the two were on a crash course. Bayern won their first of what has become eight straight Bundesliga titles, and they also won the DFP Pokal that year. Messi, meanwhile, was incredible in Tito Villanova's first season in charge. 46 La Liga goals, 60 in all competitions. Barca as a team scored in all 38 La Liga matches that year. But Messi was unfortunately injured prior to the Champions League semifinals, and while he did have a cameo in the tie, the Germans won 7-0 on aggregate and went on to win the trophy and thus their only treble in the club's history. Barca did get some revenge though, as you'll remember in the 2014-15 Champions League semifinals. While Bayern won the second leg at home, Barca's dominant 3-0 win at the Camp Nou in the first leg was enough. A second treble awaited the Catalans. Overall, the Belgrana have two wins, two draws, and six losses against Bayern Munich, one of the few teams that does have a winning record all-time against Barcelona, including the two matches between the two in the 1995-96 semifinals of the Europa League. Barca and Bayern both in the Europa League, different times I know. But this time, Bayern are looking as strong as ever. They've already won the DFB Pokal by overwhelming Bayer Leverkusen 4-2 back in July, and winning the Bundesliga with 13 points separating them and Borussia Dortmund in second. Crazy to think that this was a team that started the season with Niko Kovac in charge and started the campaign sputtering and looking quite not like themselves. But things obviously turned around as Kovac was let go at the beginning of November, giving way to interim manager Hans Dieter Flick, who was made the permanent manager on April 3rd. Flick might be rather new to elite level head coaching, though he was Joachim Love's assistant for eight years and won a World Cup in 2014 with Germany. He was a head coach for Hoffenheim way back in 2005 in the second division, but that was a while ago. Yet, since he took over, Bayern had become a powerhouse, scoring, pressing, and most importantly, winning. Bayern play a 4-2-3-1 when they attack, very fluid, and a 4-1-4-1 when they defend. So let's talk defense first. They want to press and turn over the opposing team, particularly on the flanks, so Alba and Semedo beware. When Benjamin Pavard was healthy, something he may not be for the clash against Barcelona, he plays at right back, and Kimmich really gets to flourish as a defensive midfielder. Against Chelsea, Kimmich went back and covered at right back so he may not be able to serve as the one in front of the defense that he does so well when Bayern are defending. Regardless of where Kimmich is, Davies and the right back, probably Kimmich, will look to pinch on any passing to go out wide up the pitch and trust the midfielders to keep their shape and cover the space in case they are bypassed. What allows the outside backs to pinch is the pressure that Lewandowski puts on whichever center back has the ball. The real pressure comes once the center backs try to feed the ball to anyone but each other or the goalkeeper. As we spoke about on the podcast, when Bayern attack, they like to attack from right to left up the pitch. In so many of the Bavarian successful buildups, the ball is switched from the right to the left, where Davies is able to use his pace and dynamism to go right out of defense. As I've said, Semedo was good against Napoli, but he'll have to repeat that offensive performance and find a way to up the defensive performance as well, as he deals with Davies and most likely Perisic on the left wing. It should be Roberto or Vidal as the right interior for Barca, and part of that job is helping out on Bayern's dangerous left flank. Bayern have so many players that can serve as playmakers up the middle. Jerome Boateng or Nicolas Sula, whoever is the right center back, will be the more conservative of the two. But the left center back, David Alaba, can get forward if Barca give him space, knowing that Thiago or Leon Goretzka will cover for him. Those two can also playmake from the two of that 4-2-3-1, and expect them to both operate at times on the same vertical half of the field, as to overload one side for the quick switch of play. Manuel Neuer is having about 90% of his best season, but looking much like his old self. 
Barca can't take for granted his long passing as part of Bayern's build-up. Part of that attack is also Serge Gnabry, who should be feared in his own right with 12 goals and 11 assists this season, second on the team in both those categories. The category leaders are two players that kool need no introduction to, of course, and are obviously the most dangerous players on the pitch for Bayern. Thomas Müller, the Raumdatter, the space interpreter or space investigator in German, sits right behind Lewandowski. He won't dribble at the back line often, but he will float his position so that he can find those pockets between the lines and set up teammates. He can also pop up with a goal, eight actually, to go along with his 21 assists. The Polish striker, meanwhile, has 34 goals in all different ways. Feet, head, penalty spot, you name it. There is no Ballon d'Or this season, but the winds were starting to whisper about a certain Lewandowski perhaps taking home the honor. That is my projected starting lineup, but it wouldn't be crazy for Flick to go with another option to add a wrinkle to the equation. Expect Felipe Coutinho, with his 8 goals and 6 assists, to come off the bench. He hasn't been a player that Bayern are willing to fork over the large sums for his permanent services, but he was a valuable player for them this season. Unlike in Spain, there is no clause that a player can't play against his parent club, and this time around, there won't be any Barca fans to hush. It's unlikely, but Flick could also opt to use Alvaro Ordiazola on loan from Real Madrid at right back to push Kimmich into the midfield, but I don't see that happening. They also have the luxury of bringing 80 million euro defender Lucas Hernandez off the bench, plus Corentin Tolisso, Javi Martinez, and potentially Kinsley Coman if he can get fit in time, which seems likely. As I mentioned before, Pavard is unlikely to feature and may be ruled out by the time you see this. Luckily for Barca, Leroy Sané, who just arrived from Man City, will have to wait until next season to join the party. So what can Barca do against the German juggernaut? If I'm Setien, I consider trying to manmark Müller. Busquets may not be the man for this job, and we have seen Frankie de Jong get that task in other fixtures prior to the stoppage. This would make Barca appear that de Jong is deeper than Busquets, at least while defending, but that wouldn't be the case when attacking. Bayern are going to be fluid. Barca are going to have to be flexible, too, to keep up. As I said before, Semedo is going to need to have one of the best games of his career against Perisic and Davies. The real question is who Setien chooses to support him as the right interior, Roberto or Vidal. Vidal could also set up behind a two-striker pairing of Suarez and Messi, so I would say it'll be Roberto there and Vidal either higher up or starting on the bench. This also makes sense to me because Barcelona do not want to get overwhelmed in the middle of the park. Playing that 4-3-1-2 with Vidal would make Barca feel a bit defensive, but we all know that this game will be won first and foremost by Messi, who hopefully will be completely healthy after that knock against Napoli. It doesn't mean he'll be doing it alone, Honestly, Vidal's late runs into the box may cause more havoc than Griezmann's runs to the near post, so I seem to be talking myself into this. Barca need to be tidy on the ball, Bayern will press, but that also means there will be rare opportunities to capitalize. As I spoke about in the podcast, Bayern's undoing would come from an individual mistake by one or two players, not from the unit unraveling. Like Barca, the dressing room has some big characters in it, and you could argue that the Bayern players run the club more than the manager. Sound familiar? The difference is that there seems to be no power imbalance. Every Bayern manager has to learn this, even Pep in his own special way, and issues stop at the door. The mentality of the squad is ruthless, unwavering, but they are still human. Starting with Neuer and talk about the motivation for Ter Stegen here, occasionally gets his positioning wrong, more so in open play than on set pieces. Boateng and Sula do make the occasional mistake. Muller does have the rare 90 minutes when he can't seem to pop up in the spots that he kills teams in. Lewandowski is almost always critical, and Barca has to hope that it's almost and not always. In the midfield, Goretzka covers every blade of grass, but he is prone to passing errors. Thiago rarely ever makes a passing error beside him, but his positioning in one-on-one defending can be an issue if Kimmich is stuck at right back. Davies usually gets back and covers, but there may be the rare occasion when he can't get back in time to clean up a mess. As for Kimmich, well, he can only play one position, and if it's right back, he may have less of an impact on the match. That's all I got on Kimmich. There is a record somewhere of me saying that Barca should have gone for him all the way back when he was with Stuttgart, but that is always a pipe dream with any highly rated Bundesliga youngster. The wild cards for Barcelona are those expected to be coming off the bench in Ricky Puj, Ansu Fati, and potentially Usmane Dembele. I think it would be in Barcelona and Kike Setien's best interest to keep the availability of Dembele as quiet as possible for as long as possible, just to add a little bit of a wrinkle to Barcelona's game plan that Bayern will have to be prepared for. As far as Ricky Puj and Ansu Fati go, as we said, it would be brave for Setien to potentially start Puj, but if those two weren't on the field for opening kickoff against Napoli, you can't imagine that they'll be on the field against Bayern Munich to start. However, 
Unlike against Napoli, when Setien held on to his substitutes as he held on to the match, I expect Barca and many expect Barca to be on the back foot. So Ricky Puj, Ansu Fati, and again, potentially Ousmane Dembele need to be featuring in this match before it's too late. Because the nature of this preview feels so morbid, I'm going to leave you with something that's a little bit out there. Emily Dickinson said, hope is a thing with feathers. And with Messi, there is always hope. All right, so she didn't say that Messi part, but it is true. Barcelona have not been good enough the entire season to win the Champions League. But we know that Europe can be just as much about luck as it can be about dominant performances. Win or lose, Francesca and I will be breaking it all down early next week wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be doing a tactical breakdown as well here on the channel. So be sure not to miss that by giving this video a like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. And as always, until next time, Force of Arsa.